In this lesson, we will take a look at some further uh, ramifications of introducing caches into um, our systems as far as ramifications on the pipeline, as well as calculating execution time, as well as better understanding uh, spatial locality and cache organization. And so when we understand or take a look at what's, how does a cache affect our pipeline and the various stages, what we can do is instead of memory, we can incorporate an appropriate cache for the areas as needed. And so in this case, we have it in both the instruction fetch, pick, the instruction fetch stage as well as in the memory stage. And so with this in mind, we're able to make effective use of appropriate cycle times in the, in the pipeline using the caches with respect to whether the results will be, whether the results will result in an appropriate hit or miss with regards to the cache. And so there are various considerations that need to be taken into uh, account when we're dealing with our five stage pipeline. And so what are some of the basic actions that we need to take into account for the processor and the cache? Well, we need to understand what would happen on a read hit. And so if when the CPU sends an appropriate uh, index to index of a memory address to the cache, we want to be able to look up it and determine if it's been successful, if it has resulted in a cache hit. And so if, if it does, it will supply us with the necessary data to the CPU. On the other hand, if, the, if it results in a cache miss, then the CPU will need to send the appropriate memory address that is needed to main memory. And so in Ideally, these actions occur within the same cycle, whether they are occurring within the instruction fetch stage or the memory stage of our pipeline. We need to also uh, understand what might happen if we have a read miss. And so in this, in this case, if we do have a read miss, we'll need to retrieve that appropriate memory uh, from, re re retrieve the appropriate address from memory. And this could occur uh, in many cycles. We also have appropriate considerations that need to be taken with appropriate write through. In this case, uh, data is written to the cache and it is also written to memory. There are also appropriate considerations that must be made for a write back. And so if data is written to the cache, it will be then written back to the cache later. And so let's consider uh, our policy that's associated with appropriate write throughs. At a basic level, what we want to be able to do is ensure that we're appropriately updating the cache and the main memory on each CPU write operation. And so th this allows for a few basic actions to, that need to occur. And so in this case, we have our write buffer that is being utilized. And it's important to consider that with this example, there is uh, additional hardware and that's needed. So we need to allow the CPU to proceed while the memory is finishing its write cycle. And so with an appropriate write back cache, we'll need to have appropriate uh, additional information that is included for data that is housed in our cache entry. And so, Specifically, the metadata in each cache entry is going to be utilized through our valid bit and our tag field. 
but this doesn't necessarily provide us with the, 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 the required information in order for us to, to make a decision in the cache. And so we'll need to add additional metadata for each cache entry. And we'll call this a, a dirty bit. And so with our additional data metadata, the data gets written back when someone needs the cash row. And so let's consider what happens when we have a, a read miss stall. Let's consider that we have five instructions occurring. Instruction one is going to load data into R1 at memory at A. We have an add instruction that is going to add and store the contents into R3. We have an and operation where the result will be stored in R6. We have a, a another add operation for instruction four where the contents are stored in R2. And then we have a add instruction that occurs uh, in instruction five, where the results are stored in R2. And what we notice is that we have a dependency of R1 between instruction one and instruction five. And so at this, in this respect, what we can do is treat the read miss memory very similar to how we would previously treated with registers and the busy bits. So memory can reset the busy bit for R1 when it sees the read complete for instruction one. And this, this can be done instead of waiting for a write back to occur. So now that we have um, introduce caches, let's revisit um, how we're able to calculate execution time. So previously, what we considered the execution time to be n times the average CPI cycles um, times the cycle time. And we consider that effective CPI is going to be the CPI average plus memory stalls average. So now we have a new execution time that we can consider. We can have the, we can have n times the CPI effective times the cycle time, which further can be broken into n times the CPI average plus the m stalls average times the cycle time. And we calculate the memory stalls average to be the misses per instruction average times the miss penalty average. Total memory stalls will be equal to n times the memory stalls average. So let's consider an example in which we want to calculate the effective CPI. We have an average CPI of 1.5. Average cache miss per instruction is going to equal to 3%. And the miss penalty is going to be equal to 20. And so given this information, we want to calculate what the effective CPI is. And so in order to do this, we can use our formula where we say 1.5 plus 3% of 20, and that is going to give us 1.5 plus 0.6, which gives us our average, our effective CPI to be 2.1. So let's consider another example. Consider that we have a pipeline processor that has an average CPI of 1.8 without accounting for memory stalls. Our iCache has a hit rate of 95%. Our Dcache has a hit rate of 98%. Now let's assume that memory reference instructions account for 
30% of all the instructions executed. And so we have 80% or loads and 20% or stores. On average, we'll have a read miss penalty that is equal to 20 cycles and the write miss penalty is five cycles. Here, what we want to do is compute the effective CPI of the processor accounting for appropriate memory stalls. So how can we calculate this? Well, first, what we'll need to do is calculate the cost of instruction misses. So iCache miss rate times the read miss penalty is going to be equal to one minus 0.95 times 20. And this gives us one cycle per instruction. We'll need to consider the cost of data read misses. And so this is going to be equal to the percent memory reference instructions times the fraction that are loads times the decash miss rate times the read miss penalty. So th that would give us a calculation of 0.3 times 0.8 times 0 0.02 times 20, which gives us 0 0.096 cycles per instruction. Then we'll need to calculate the cost of the data write misses, which is going to equal to the percent of memory reference instructions times the fraction that are stores, times the decache miss rate, times the read miss penalty. This will give us 0 .03, 0 0.3 times 0 0.2 times 0 .9, 0 0.02 times 5, which gives us 0 0.006 cycles per instruction. And so in order for us to calculate the effective CPI, it is going to be the CPI average plus the cost of iCache misses plus the cost of decash misses. So that will give us 1.8 plus 1 plus 0 0.096 plus 0 0.006, which is going to simplify to 2.902 for our effective CPI. And so let's consider some mechanisms that we can use in order to improve cash efficiency. What we want to be sure is that we reduce the, the miss rate exploits using our principles of spatial locality. And so what this means is that we want to be sure that we're able to bring more memory into a cache at a time. And we also want to be sure that we're making use of bringing memory into the cache in adjacent locations upon a miss from our memory location. So for each entry in the cache, we want to ensure um, the unit of memory access is architected in the, the instruction set that we're utilizing. So in order for us to be able to ex exploit spatial locality, we're going to need to focus on a be better organization and be able to decouple the unit of memory access by an instruction from the unit of memory transfer between the memory and the cache. And so let's consider that we have an example of four blocks that we want to utilize. In this sense, we want to make sure that for each memory access, the processor would be utilizing one byte. And we want to have the unit of memory transfer be, uh, be designed based off of our memory hierarchy. So in order for us to do this, we need to ensure that the unit of transfer between the cache and the memory is equivalent to the appropriate block size. 
if we have a miss, then the cache brings an entire block of the block size bytes that contains the missing memory reference. So how can we interpret the, the memory address that we're going to use? Essentially, with each entry in our cache, we, we, we're going to have them organized as contiguous words of blocks. So the address that we generate from the CPU will contain three parts. We're going to have a cache tag, we're going to have a cache index, and we're going to have a block offset. We'll denote that S is going to equal the size of the cache, B is going to equal the block size, and L are going to equal the lines in the cache. And so we can have appropriate uh, calculations to use to, to determine each of these components for our memory address. And with the block address, you just want to assume that it is essentially going to just be the word number within the, the block. And so taking a look at a multi-word cache organization, we can assume here that we have a, we're, we're, we've organized it in the form of having 64 bytes with a block offset of six bytes. And so we have all of the data that is given into, given in a block contained in one cache entry. And we'll make use of a multiplexer to bring the data to the CPU. And so the block offset is going to choose a specific word uh, that will be used to send to the CPU through the multiplexer. And so one other thing that we have to deal with is uh, a write and miss with a uh, multiple word cache. So we will have a, a block that's bigger than a word. And so upon a hit, the, the CPU writes the specific word into the cache. And this is dependent on the write policy but the missing block is, is first copied from memory into the cache. Only then do we update the, the specific word that is being written. And so let's consider a multiple, a multiple word cache example. We have a direct map cache and we wanna have it ha contain a 32 bit byte addressable memory address. We'll have each memory word contains four bytes. We'll have a, a block size that is going to equal to four words. And then we'll have a memory access spring. We'll bring in a block. And so we'll make use of a 64-bit byte cache and a write-back cache with the 30-bit per word. In order to implement our, our multiple our multi-word cache, we'll need to make use of at least 12 bits that will represent bits uh, 15 to 4 of our memory address for the index. We'll then use the remaining 16 bits represented from bits 31 to 16 of the memory address to constitute the tag. And so this provides us with a high level overview of how the CPU interprets the memory address.
So what happens if we increase the block size? This can in result in exploit in a better way for us to exploit a more spatial locality and also reduce the miss rate. So if we continue to increase the block size, that can help to reduce our miss rate. However, this will only continue um, for a certain point. Eventually, our block size does not continue to reduce and eventually it will reach a point where things will get worse and the trajectory will start, start to go back into the opposite direction. And so you wanna consider that when the working set changes, larger blocks have to be fetched and memory can only transfer so fast and it can become a, a bottleneck in the system. So we can continue to increase our block size up to a certain point, but there becomes a point where the memory bus becomes the bottleneck and uh, a larger block size no longer is as effective. So what are some working set considerations that need to take, be taken into account? When we have a, a direct map cache, we, we want to keep in mind that there is a one-to-one -one mapping from a memory address to the cache index. And because of this, we're not necessarily able to place a new memory location in an unoccupied slot in the cache. This can end up uh, inhibiting performance. And so with this in mind, we need to consider what would be some alternatives. We could consider that we could allow any memory block to be brought into any cache block. This is similar to being able to bring in a virtual page into any available physical page frame. And this constitutes uh, fully associative mapping. And so let's consider our address interpretation in a fully associative cache. We'll have our cache tag and our index. And so with this, we have no splitting memory addresses into index and tag. But and so it ends up becoming just one cache tag to represent our fully associative cache. This results in the hardware being able to comprise replicated comparators for, for each entry in our cache. And that therefore results in having the tag comparisons result uh, in parallel to determine if we have a hit. So within a fully associative cache circuitry, we want to consider that we have our parallel tags that are utilized for appropriate matching. And we want to make use of each block in the cache will represent an independent cache. So with this in mind, we'll have our tag matching that occurs in parallel to determine a hit or miss and given a memory block, it can be present in any of the, the cache blocks that we have shown here. So we have one to end cache blocks that we can make use of. Once we have a hit, the data from the block can be successively mat matched to the memory address and that is then sent to the CPU. So let's consider what are what, what some of the hardware complexity associated with the fully associative cache would be. How many comparators would we need? And also how big does each comparator, comparator need to be? We 
with a fully associative cache, we have too much hardware complexity, but it's, it's more flexible. With the direct map cache, we have less hardware complexity, but it's less flexible as well. So what can we do to make a better uh, mapping scheme for caches? What might be a good compromise? In order to do this, we can introduce another cache structure called set associative cache. And so this provides us with a, a good middle ground between the, the, the lower cost hardware associated with the direct map cache and the more complex hardware that is associated with a, a fully associative cache. And so let's consider that we have a direct map cache within rows and a fully associative cache with one to n uh, cache blocks that are compared in parallel. A set associative cache will make use of a combination by providing uh, memory blocks that are associated with a specific set of cache blocks. So if we were to make use of a two-way set associative cache, this will mean that memory blocks can be stored in two possible, two possible homes within our cache. And conversely, with the four-way set associative, it can be stored in one of four blocks. And what we want to consider is that there's a degree of associativity that we'll make use of, and that is going to be the number of homes that a memory block can be placed within a cache. And so if we have a four-way set associative cache, then that means that we'll have four parallel caches that are compared. And so let's consider that we can organize our cache blocks within our direct map cache into 16 blocks. This in turn could be organized as a two-way set associative block two-way set associative, which contains eight blocks in parallel. Or it could also be organized as a four-way set associative, each containing four blocks in parallel. In total, depending on the structure, we're still going to have 16 blocks total that are being used. And so with with considering each of our each of our organizations, we can see that our direct direct map cache requires a four bit index for lookup, while our uh, our two way set associative requires a requires a, a three-bit index. And our four-way requires a two-bit index. And so let's consider that we have four different ways of saying the same thing in that we can have a cache line, cache block, cache entry, and cache element. These all mean the same thing. And so they're basically going to denote the basic unit of data that we've transferred into and out of the cache at a time. You wanna consider the textbook has a, a few typos. Um, current usage 
um, for 914 and 934 implies uh, cash set. And so you want to consider that a cash set is a row in the cash. The number of blocks per set is determined by the type of the cash. And so with the direct, direct map, we have N sets and one element with P way set associative caches. We have N over P sets and P elements. A fully associative has one set with N elements. And so if we were to consider this, and applying it to our other example, we see we have 16 sets for a direct map, eight sets of two elements for our two-way set associative, and four sets of four elements for our four-way set associative implementation. So let's consider the hardware complexity that we make use of in an example of a four-way set associative cache. We can use a four-to-one multiplexer and for our address, we'll have a byte offset of two bits. And so we want to make use of the four-way set associative where each, where, where each one will have a 32-bit memory byte addressable address. The cache size of 64 kilobits. So each, so one, a 1K cache size is being utilized. And so with the index, it's going to have a size of 10. We'll make use of our cache block size as being 16 bytes. Our tag is going to be represented by T. The cache block size is going to be 16 times 8, which is 128. So that is going to be used to represent the data. And we'll have one bit for our valid bit. So giving this, we want to be able to compute the total amount of storage for implementing the cache. And so that's going to be actual data plus the metadata. And so we can consider 1 plus 18 plus 128 times 1K times 4 over 8. And so that's going to give us 75,264 bytes for the total storage for implementing this cache. And so what is going to be the hardware complexity? We're going to make use of four 18-bit comparators. Okay, so a few questions. So in a fully associative cache with 64 kilobytes of data and 64 bytes per block with a t-bit tag, do we need four t-bit tag comparators, 64 t-bit tag comparators, 1K t-bit tag comparators, or there is one t-bit tag comparator for the entire cache? And so for a fully associative, we're going to need at least one, we're going to need 1K t-bit tag comparators. So that requires a lot of comparators for us to use. Thus the uh, additional hardware complexity associated with the fully associative cache. 
So let's consider in a, a four-way set associative cache. It has 64 kilobits of data, 64 bytes per block with a t-bit tag. Well, we need four t-bit tag comparators, 64 t-bit tag comparators, 1K t-bit tag comparators, or one t-bit tag comparator for the entire cache. And with a four-way set associative, we're gonna need to have that represented by at least by four t-bit tag comparators. And so this provides us with an understanding of the hardware ramifications associated with uh, fully associative as well as uh, set associative caches.